It's decision day in America. After months of campaigning, hundreds of rallies and tens of millions of votes already cast, it all comes down to today. In a race that saw a presidential debate prompt a change at the top of the Democratic ticket and two apparent assassination attempts against a former president, Kamala Harris and Donald Trump are finally off the campaign trail and now it's up to voters to determine the future of the country. The vice president spent her last day on the trail in the pivotal swing state of Pennsylvania. She made her final push on the steps the movie Rocky made famous right outside the Philadelphia Museum of Art. We are optimistic and we are excited about what we can do together. And we know it is time for a new generation of leadership in America. Meanwhile, the former president crisscrossed battleground states with stops in North Carolina and Pennsylvania before ending his evening in Michigan. We will never give in. We will never give up. We will never back down and we will never, ever surrender. Together, we will fight, 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 and we will win, win, win. We have so much to get to on a busy and consequential morning. Thank you for joining me. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe Fryer will join us soon from the battleground state of Wisconsin. It is now 9 a.m. on the East Coast. It is 6 a.m. on the West Coast. Voting is underway with more polling places opening up each hour across the country. But at midnight Eastern time, we saw the very first in-person votes of Election Day. These were cast in the tiny New Hampshire hamlet of Dixville Notch, as they are first every Election Day. And get this, in a race that is neck and neck, of course, the six votes cast were split evenly between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. We're covering it all for you this morning. We have a team of correspondents spanned out across the country. Our friend Jonathan Allen, he's right here on set. He's standing by for analysis throughout the morning. We're going to begin our coverage, though, on the campaign trail. We're going to be with NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander. He's in Philadelphia. Good morning to you. The Harris campaign hoping the road to the White House goes through Pennsylvania. The lines here in Philly formed early this morning. The first voter we saw getting here at 5 a.m. Tens of thousands on hand, though, until midnight almost last night. A massive rally for Vice President Harris. And the Harris team is really projecting confidence. A Harris ally telling me going into Election Day, they would rather be in her heels than in his shoes. Vice President Harris punctuating a frenetic final day in Philadelphia with an army of supporters in front of the famed Rocky Steps. Here at these famous steps, a tribute to those who start as the underdog and climb to victory. Closing out her three and a half month sprint in the critical battleground. One more day in the most consequential election of our lifetime and the momentum is on our side. The vice president turning to star power and celebrity endorsements on election eve. God bless America. All of it after Harris had already swung through Pittsburgh. We need everyone to vote Pennsylvania. The Harris campaign touting its robust ground game operation with Harris herself making a surprise appearance to knock on doors. I just wanted to come by and say I hope to earn your vote. Earlier, making a detour at a Puerto Rican restaurant, trying to capitalize on that offensive comment about the island made last week by a comedian during former President Trump's Madison Square Garden rally. I stand here proud of my long-standing commitment to Puerto Rico and her people, and I will be a president for all Americans. Ahead of Election Day, the nation's capital bracing for possible unrest, with giant steel fencing going up around the White House, Capitol, and the vice president's residence and many storefronts boarded up. While last night in Pennsylvania, one of Harris's most prominent supporters, Oprah Winfrey, delivered this dire warning. If we don't show up tomorrow, it is entirely possible that we will not have the opportunity to ever cast a ballot again. Still, the vice president projected a positive message without ever mentioning former President Trump by name, urging Americans to turn the page. We know it is time for a new generation of leadership in America. 
Tonight, Harris will watch the returns come in from the vice president's residence in Washington before joining her supporters at her alma mater, Howard University. And while she has largely steered clear of embracing the historic nature of her campaign, of course, the potential to become the first woman president, last night her supporters really leaned in with Oprah leading the crowd in a chant of what was a bit of a twist on that famous Obama phrase from 2008. Yes, she can. Back to you. Peter Alexander, thanks so much for kicking us off. Well, security preparations are underway as the Trump campaign gets ready to host an election night watch party later from the convention center there. For more on how the former president concluded his campaign for a second term, we head to NBC News correspondent Garrett Hake in West Palm Beach. For Donald Trump, a final campaign closeout overnight in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This is my last, my last rally. Can you believe it? The rallies, these big, beautiful rallies. The former president not taking the stage until after midnight, delivering a familiar message in the same city he ended his previous two White House bids. We will launch the most extraordinary economic boom the world has ever seen. Trump sowing doubt about a potentially lengthy vote counting process. What the hell's happening in the inside of those machines? If you wait, we want the answer tonight. While also insulting his political opponents, including former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She's an evil, sick, crazy. Oh no. It starts with a B, but I won't say it. I want to say it. The late night rally capping off a four stop battleground blitz across the swing states that will likely determine the next president. Earlier in Pittsburgh, Trump laying out his closing argument. But America will be bigger, better, bolder, richer, safer and stronger than ever before. Sure. During a lengthy and at times meandering speech, Trump appearing to blame his supporters if he loses Pennsylvania. I mean, we're certainly on the two or three yard line, and the only way we can blow it is if you blow it. I've given you the ball. I mean, you got to go and vote. And on the final day of campaigning, Trump's running mate, J.D. Vance, stumping in Georgia, a state Trump lost by fewer than 12,000 votes in 2020 and hopes to flip this time around. In the campaign's closing days, after that comedian's comments calling Puerto Rico garbage and President Biden then appearing to say the same of Trump's supporters disputed by the White House, Vance please, chose please. to have the please, last please. word. We are going to take out the trash in Washington, D.C., and the trash's name is Kamala Harris. Our thanks to Garrett Haig for that report. While Trump is expected to vote alongside his wife, Melania, in West Palm Beach a little later this morning before watching the results come in live from Mar-a-Lago. Now let's do a little battleground blitz. We are going to start with our very own Joe Fryer. He is in Waukesha County, Wisconsin. Joe, good morning. So you are in one of three counties. You told us this earlier called the WOW counties. You'll give us that acronym again. But this is where Democrats will be hoping to win over this area from Republicans. Help us to understand what's at stake where you are today. We know how important Wisconsin is. As you also mentioned earlier, we've been talking about it so much over these past few weeks. But how could an area like this really contribute to a potential win? Well, one sign that a lot is at stake and that this area is really motivated is the fact that here in the village of McWanago, the polls opened just over an hour ago. When you saw us an hour ago, it was packed. We saw a line of like 50, 60 people waiting to come in before the polls even opened. The line wrapped around. It was packed in here for about an hour, finally starting to quiet down. But I can tell you so far this morning, 274 people have cast their ballots in, in person with a few more putting it in. We're about to have... 275 folks still coming in here. They expect to see another rush around the lunch hour and then again picking up again mid-afternoon into the evening hours here. You mentioned this is Waukesha County. That is one of the wow counties. That's Waukesha, Ozaki, and Washington counties. These are the suburbs of Milwaukee. They have long been a Republican stronghold. But what we've seen in the last decade is that Democrats have been able to chip away at the Republican advantage here. Republicans will still win these counties, but Vice President Harris hopes to kind of cut into that a little bit more. Here's an example of what we've seen in the last decade. You look at Hillary Clinton in 2016, this county, Waukesha County, she got about 33 percent of the vote. Four years later, President Biden got nearly 39 percent of the vote. That's the first time that has happened since Michael Dukakis back in 1988. Democrats are optimistic. They're hoping if they do well, they can get to the 40 percent mark here. That would be the first time that's happened since the early 1960s when LBJ was 
was on the ballot, Savannah. Wow. And, and Joe, what are you hearing from voters there? You've got, you've had almost 280 of them come by you. Have you been chatting with some of them? Or any inkling what could happen here? Yeah, we have not chatted with all 280, but we have <laughs> chatted with a few of the voters here. One person told us, you know, anecdotally, she can tell you that she's seen relatives in her family who had always voted for Trump switching to Vice President Harris this year. Folks will tell you just in this county, they've started to see more signs for Harris, more signs for Democrats than they've seen in previous years, a sign of what's going on here. One of the theories behind why this county has turned bluer is that you have a lot a lot of folks who actually work in Milwaukee, but then they've moved out here to the suburbs. This is about a half hour away from Milwaukee, and they're living out here. These are younger people, so they've turned the suburb a little bit bluer. But to counter that, on the flip side, we did speak with two young people who do just that. They work in Milwaukee, but they live out here in Waukesha County. They told us they voted for former President Trump today. They say the economy is the primary reason. Democrats are under no mm. illusion that they're actually going to win these counties. The goal the goal is they want to try and improve on President Biden's performance from four years ago. For former President Trump, the goal is to try and slow or stop the bleeding in these counties because they know Harris is going to do well in Madison and Milwaukee. Trump is going to do well in the many rural parts of this state. It could come down to these counties here surrounding Milwaukee. Savannah? And it really becomes that margin game when we talk about the, the greater vote count here in, in Wisconsin. Joe, I want to let John Allen jump in, but just really quickly, I do want to ask you, because I, I think viewers are wondering, this is one of those states that doesn't start processing those mail-in ballots until today. Are, are they ready to do so? What's in place to get that done quickly? They are absolutely ready. Here in Wisconsin, they had one and a half million people cast their ballots early. Now, that is absentee. So even if you showed up early in person, you're casting an absentee ballot. That goes inside an envelope. Those could not be processed till the polls opened at 7 a.m. local time today. I want to show you here. That's actually what's happening at this table where we see all these people in these yellow and orange vests. The moment the polls opened today, they started opening up those envelopes, processing the ballots, checking the signatures, and counting these ballots. They counted a few hundred of them when I checked recently. In all, in this village, 3,400 people cast absentee ballots. That means already, just before the polls even opened today, you had 61% voter turnout in this village. They're hoping when you add that to the in-person turnout here, they could have 95% voter turnout in this village here in Waukesha County. Savannah? All right, John has a burning question about Wisconsin for you, Joe. I'm going to let him jump in here. Go ahead, John. <laughs> First, Joe, I gotta say that the, the, hey, Joe, I gotta say the orange and yellow vests in there it looks like Donald Trump doing cosplay as a garbage worker earlier in this election <laughs> cycle. A similar look. Like perhaps that's just uh, you know electioneering uh, within the yeah. within the polling place there. Um, the question I have for you though is uh, obviously those suburbs you've you've gone to the right place to figure out sort of what the uh, you know what the Republican advantage is in tradi traditionally Republican places and Democrats can cut into it. What are you hearing from uh, from Milwaukee? What are you hearing from uh, Dane County, Wisconsin, where Madison is, uh, the sort of traditional huge, uh, huge turnout spots for Democrats? Are, are they expecting to get what they normally get out of those places? A little more, perhaps a little less? That'll be the... That'll be the key. I think, you know, Madison, I think the Harris campaign feels fairly confident around. You had a lot of college students there, different from 2020, when obviously we were dealing with COVID. College students have been getting organized and motivated. I think the Harris campaign feels good that they can do well in Madison. Milwaukee's a little different because the population has, has shrunk a little bit in the last four years. So, you know, they want to make sure they can get out everyone they possibly can. Early voting is always a good sign. And there were signs early on in the early voting that Milwaukee was behind a little bit, but that did seem to change at the end. At the end of early voting, Milwaukee did seem to have a pretty big turnout. That is going to be key. I mean, really what it comes down to is both of these sides know where their support is. Harris needs to supercharge Madison, needs to supercharge Milwaukee. Trump needs to supercharge all the rural areas, and there are a lot of rural areas here in Wisconsin. Uh, that's why this could come down to the suburbs. And what happens here? If Harris can get to that 40 percent mark here in Waukesha County, this is the third largest county in the entire state. That could be huge. That could be just enough. Because remember, Trump barely won by less than a percentage point in 2016. Biden barely won by less than a percentage point in 2020. Savannah and John.
right, Joe, thank you so much, John. Thanks for jumping in. Let's continue our little battleground blitz. We're going to head over to Georgia now. That's where NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander is. She's in Cobb County. Polls have been open for a couple hours now. But, Blaine, we did see that record early voting in Georgia, more than 4 million ballots cast. So what is turnout looking like now, day of this morning? And importantly, why are people telling you that they're getting up and they're getting out? That word motivating, their motivating issue, it's so important to understand where this may go. You know what I think is interesting, too, Savannah, when I've talked with voters, a couple of them have told me that it's just their tradition. They really like to be part of this process. There's something special about coming out on Election Day, even though Georgia, of course, had those many days of early voting, that they wanted to come out and cast their ballot on Election Day. And that's what we've seen from some of the people here. Now, as for what we're expecting to see today, you're right. Four million people have already cast their ballot. Officials are expecting another one million or so to come out statewide today. So I'm standing here at one polling location in Cobb County. I can show you a little bit. I can't get much closer than where I am right now just because of rules prohibiting us from getting too close to the door. But this is where we've seen people going in all morning long. It's been a steady stream of people. I've talked to people as they kind of have come out bit by bit and they say that, yeah, wait time was about 20, 25 minutes earlier this morning. It's dwindled down to like five or so minutes now. So a pretty easy stream to get in and out of this location. I did speak with a couple of people to ask that question, what you talked about, why and how they're feeling around Election Day today. Take a look. A lot of people talk about kind of like election anxiety. Um, does this election feel different to you? Does it feel, does the mood around this election feel different? I think so. Um, I am planning to leave work a little early. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to have the news on all day, probably all night into the night. We have some young kids, so we'll get them to bed and probably be staring at the news. Um, I think up until today, I've been a little nervous, but for some reason, I've kind of a breath of fresh air this morning. I don't really know what it is, but maybe it's just because it's election day. And the big question that everyone's having is when will we start to see results? Well, here in Georgia, because of a change in state law, Savannah, we know that by 8 p.m. or an hour after polls close across the state, that all counties have to start uploading those absentee ballots, most of those absentee ballots, I should say, and all of the early voting ballots. So given the fact that already we've seen about 4 million people, another million expected today, we're talking about 80 percent of the results or so that should be tabulated starting around 8 o'clock tonight. Blaine, also, I want to ask you specifically because people, of course, remember how important Georgia became when there was some confusion over what was going on. There were legal challenges. And over the past couple of days, Republicans have filed a series of lawsuits challenging election officials, particularly in Fulton County. They're questioning the way in which absentee ballots were collected. We also have other lawsuits that have to do with certifying the election results. Walk us through the claims and where these lawsuits stand and the potential impact on, on finding out uh, which way Georgia goes. Yeah, and I think, you know, in talking with officials, it doesn't seem that that's going to be the last of the legal challenges. They are anticipating more to come this week. Let me start with Fulton County. That's, of course, Metro Atlanta as well. Uh, there were lawsuits, a couple of lawsuits filed over the weekend by the state Republican Party, National Republican Party, basically challenging the way that absentee ballots were received. They opened a couple of government buildings in the county to allow people to return their absentee ballots. Well, a state judge very quickly said that that practice is legal. Those can be returned up until poll. Uh, closing of polls today, so 7 o'clock today, uh, but there's a similar federal lawsuit that is now also making its way through the court, challenging that practice in several of Georgia's counties. I talked with the chairman of the commission, the board of commissions in Fulton County, Rob Pitts. He told me during a news conference yesterday they expect to see more challenges, but they're ready. Take a look. I believe and we believe that the groundwork is being laid for some challenges at some point in the future. But we get sued every day. So the answer to the question is we are prepared. There will be no basis for any challenge. But that does not prevent someone, anyone, from filing a suit. If a suit or suits come forward, we will be prepared to defend the great work that we've done and all the preparations been put into ensuring that this election is open, fair, and transparent. And Savannah, that really is the posture that we have heard from election officials from county to county and across the state. Of course, you know, Georgia was very much in the spotlight, specifically Fulton County with 2020. They said that they've changed a number of things. They are ready this time around to kind of alleviate those questions and get the results tabulated as quickly as possible. Savannah. Absolutely. Good information for people to have, especially after that confusion. Blaine, I've got John Allen here with us. He's helping us out on the morning, and he also has a burning question when it comes to Georgia. Am I right? Yeah, I have a burning question. Right? But first let's of all, go, let's go. mostly I 
wanted to ask the burning question to tell Blaine how thrilled I am <laughs> to watch her on TV all the time because I have known her since she oh first God, started at NBC. Is. She must have been 21, 22 years old, and she's so amazing. <laughs> exactly. I'm such a phenomenal reporter. <laughs> she is. I, and by I'm, the way, I'm like, I feel some pride just in having known you way back when. And, and so, by the way, pride. I was triple, <laughs> double, quadru quadrupled. For anybody who doesn't know, Blaine has now become our latest Dateline correspondent, which is like so impressive and fantastic and amazing. Blaine, congrats, by the way. Okay, go ahead. Uh, have, We're but, done with our Blaine Love Fest. But, Never done with I the Blaine Love Fest. But, thank you, thank but, you. Um, but congratulations. <laughs> and also, you live in this community. You live in Georgia. You work in Georgia. Mm, yeah. What's your feel for the state from where it was in 2000, where Joe Biden had, I'm sorry, 2020, where Joe Biden had that um, surprise victory by 10,000 votes or so? How's the state changed in, in feel? Or, or are you able to, to try to do that, um, given how close these races yeah. are? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. One, I, I love that question, too. Thank you so much for all of the love. But I love the spirit of that question because, yes, when you talk to Democrats, I'll take it this way. When you talk to Democrats, they saw a tremendous sense of pride uh, from having flipped the state blue back in 2020. So when I talked to organizers, when I talked to a lot of people, they were really trying to challenge a lot of that energy. And they felt that, you know, of course, when the race was shaken up, Joe, uh, Joe Biden was out, Kamala Harris was in, that kind of re-energized them to be able to do that. Republicans, however, really want to flip it back in their column. And so what we've seen is a change in strategy. If you remember the closing days of 2020, Donald Trump Trump was going to some of those reliably red counties. He was going down to South Georgia. He was in North Georgia. He was all over the place. He has really been focusing a lot of attention on Metro Atlanta. That shows a change in strategy because he's trying to chip away at counties like the place where I'm standing right now, Cobb County, Gwinnett County, some of these counties that typically were red but flipped to blue and were a big part of Joe Biden's victory base four years ago. Now we're seeing Donald Trump and Republicans really trying to at least dilute some of that Democratic support. These are the areas that as you know, have become more diverse. They've become a lot more diverse. They're growing very quickly. We're not too far from the actual Atlanta proper. And so these are the areas where a lot of people are focusing. It's also where you're seeing a lot of the energy, where you're seeing a lot of those get out the vote rallies and the surrogates and the, cam and the candidates themselves coming in these final days. So, yes, it feels very different from 2020, but it's, there's a lot of focus on these areas and they know that those will be kind of the make or break areas for this election. Blaine, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Obviously, we love you. Got we'll it. talk to you in a little bit. Now let's get to NBC News correspondent <laughs> Antonia Hilton. She joins us from the battleground state of North Carolina. She's in its capital city. And Antonia, Raleigh's in Wake County. And I want to get kind of specific about this because it's a key county where Democrats have been building up their lead, but they'll continue to need to do so if they want to flip North Carolina because this is a total swing state. We keep calling it sort of a coin toss state type of thing. But Democrats have not won there since 2008. So so, so it would be a big deal should they take it. But there is hope. There is momentum there. Tell us about how this county plays into how crucial that would be. Well, look, this is the county that has the most precincts, the highest population, the largest turnout. And so for Democrats, they're going to be watching this area very, very closely to make sure that people turn out. And, you know, they were watching already very closely during the early voting period. In the first several days of early voting, Republicans came out really strong and Democrats were a tiny bit nervous. Then in the last several days, they started to see black communities come out and young voters in areas like Raleigh, where there are schools and young workers all starting to come out. And they think those are voters who are very much going to be coming out for Harris. Also unaffiliated and more moderate voters. This is a state with a whole lot of them. In fact, more unaffiliated people than people associated with either of the two parties, both of which are here right now trying to make their final case to people. But look, you know, as I've been talking to voters here, People feel incredibly strongly about this election and they are very motivated here. And so no matter what age or background I talk to, people believe this is going to be incredibly tight. But the Democrats feel like momentum's on their side now. Uh, even that Iowa poll, you might think it has nothing to do with this state, but has given them this sense that she may be reaching voters or meet, reaching parts of the electorate and overperforming with them that maybe, you know, we haven't seen in past cycles. And it's giving them hope that they could see something close to 2008 tonight, Savannah. Mm, absolutely. Antonia, also, I do want to ask you, not only the presidential race is important there, one of the most watched gubernatorial races on the map this year is in North Carolina. And of course, this has to do with that Republican candidate. It's Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson, rocked by a scandal in September, which really brought this to national attention. Tell us where that race stands. 
Well, look, the Democrat Josh Stein is double digits in polling ahead of Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson. And so the Democrats are feeling really, really good about that race. And look, I mean, the Trump campaign kind of pulled away from him in the final weeks of the race because of this scandal. And for anyone who was living under a rock at the time and, and perhaps doesn't remember, uh, a CNN report uncovered or alleged that he had made racist, sexist and homophobic remarks on a porn website years ago. Uh, and he kind of fell down in the polling after that and hasn't been present, hasn't been side by side with Trump at events like he used to be in the past. And so what Democrats are kind of banking on, actually, is that that scandal certainly is going to help Josh Stein, the gubernatorial candidate on their side, but actually could drag down the entire ticket. Uh, and that plus the sort of salience of abortion here and the way a lot of female voters are fired up. Women were pull, coming here sort of outperforming ahead of guys through the early voting period. They think we may see something similar here today. That's sort of part of the energy that, again, makes it feel different on the ground than it has in past cycles. I was here in 2022 for the midterms, for example, covering the Senate race here. There was hope that Democrat Sherry Beasley would be able to beat uh, Republican Ted Budd at the time unable to pull that off. And frankly, many Democrats, uh, you know, they wouldn't have bet, you know, they wouldn't have made their bets, their life savings on that race. This is something where they feel a little different. They all describe themselves as growing very bullish at this point, Savannah. Antonia, thank you so much for your reporting from Battleground, North Carolina. We'll talk to you in a bit. And our election night coverage kicks off later today at 5 p.m. Eastern with Tom Yamas and Hallie Jackson. Then at 6.30 p.m., Lester Holt and Savannah Guthrie take over as those results start coming in. We will bring all of you that right here on NBC News Now. We've got a lot more to get to on this election day in America, including a look at the potentially historic nature of both campaigns, plus how officials are preparing for the possibility of threats just as voters head to the polls. That's all up next. Welcome back. While Election Day is a celebration of our democratic traditions, it does not come without risks. Those risks can take form of outside interference, like Russia's attempt to hack the 2016 election, or direct threats of violence against individuals and election officials. We want to dig into this topic. We are joined by NBC National Security Analyst Clint Watts. He's also a distinguished research fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute. Clint, thanks so much for being here. Important topic we've got to cover today. And in the final days of this campaign, we are getting some warnings. Intelligence agencies warned of extremists so deeply rooted in election-related conspiracy theories. They are the most likely threat of violence in this year's election. And let me identify some of those targets. They said they range from election workers, members of the media, even candidates themselves. What measures are being taken to protect people? And, and what do you think that threat kind of looks like or manifests like here in the U.S.? Yeah, the first part of this really is intelligence, knowing what's going to happen. If you rewind to 2020, remember, we didn't know a lot about what might happen, you know, on Election Day and after Election Day. This time they know and you're seeing these warnings that lets everybody do the second part, which is prepare you're seeing a lot of security at polling places that can be everything from perimeters to places where they've seen threats are now putting law enforcement officers out there to make sure that everyone's safe. And then response. I think if you just look across the board, the situation rooms across the country of all law enforcement agencies, are they're on heightened alert. They're waiting to respond to somebody just to make sure that they can, you know, get this election through and make sure that it's done safely. We're also watching the risk from misinformation, right, both in how that can can lead people to think something incorrect is happening in the election, but then how that can anger people, inflame people, make those tensions even higher than they already are. And we just saw this weekend that intelligence, U.S. intelligence actually just warned us directly, said this video is from Russia. That's sort of an unusual step that we hear directly there. Do you think that's that's the future? And what did you make of that step? Well, it, what I found remarkable, I've been doing this yeah. for a decade now, is that happened, right? Eight years ago, yeah. there was no warning. No one really knew about this. This time, we do know about it. What we've seen with the Russians just in the last two weeks is shifting from influencing about candidates to the conduct of the election. That is a really dangerous shift because it can convince people, you know, that might be primed to go and believe one of these conspiracies that it's out there. The good news is they are refuting these fairly quickly now. There's one in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Another one uh, regarding voters in Georgia. Both those refuted very quickly, the content taken down. Mm -hmm. That's a major step forward. I, I think just looking in the next uh, 48 hours, you know, the 48 hours before and the 48 hours after election, competition, conflict, uh, confusion, any of those moments, that's when things like conspiracies and misinformation can really take off. What do you think is going on behind the scenes at U.S. intelligence and law enforcement agencies today? 
I imagine they are on full watch, but they also are much more focused than they were in past election cycles. Just think of 2016, uh, the Russian uh, influence activity caught everybody's surprise. Uh, 2020, it was domestic uh, extremists showing up, uh, polling places showing up after the yeah. election. Not this time. I think in, in this case, you're seeing across the board uh, with all agencies, they're prepared for it, they're developing their plans, and they're thinking about how to respond to it. Clint Watts, we appreciate you talking us through a serious and important topic today as everybody heads to the polls. Good to see you. Well, no matter today's outcome, there are bound to be legal challenges to the results of some races for offices big and small. We wanted to get a sense of the legal landscape surrounding today's election. So for more, we're going to bring in Guy Charles. He is the professor, Ogletree professor of law at Harvard Law School and an NBC News election law analyst. Professor, we always enjoy when you join us. Thanks very much for being here. So both parties have these big legal teams at their disposal. They are ready to go at a moment's notice. And there actually are already legal fights going on. We went through some of these in our last hour. As we sit here on election morning, what are you looking for? What's what's kind of piquing your interest when it comes to legal challenges? Any places, any issues, anything that you could see happen with either campaign? Sure. Uh, uh, thank you so much, and thanks for having me on. Look, uh, this is one of the most litigated elections already. Uh, the democracy docket uh, has um, calculated that there are over 200 lawsuits in this election. Uh, the things that are piquing my interest, particularly in the states like Pennsylvania, a battleground state, as well as Georgia, um, fights over absentee ballots and the rules for absentee ballots. Those are things that I'm keeping my eye on. Uh, poll challenges um, and uh, places like um, Arizona. Uh, those are also things that I'm keeping uh, my eye on. To what extent are, and you see that also in Pennsylvania, uh, issues over absentee ballots as well in Georgia. Uh, those are really two main issues for me. Uh, to what extent are we going to fight about the rules with respect to absentee on mail-in ballots uh, after the election? Uh, to what extent are people going to bring challenges to voters at the polls, right? So you've got poll watchers who are uh, saying this person is not qualified to vote. Uh, those are some of the two of the main issues for me that I'm keeping my eye on in light of the things that the parties have already been fighting about. There have been a lot of changes when it comes to the laws surrounding elections and how elections are carried out. We've had you know, challenges and changes to where you can drop off your ballots, to how ballots are counted, when ballots are counted. Have any of those changes, anything you've spotted that makes you think an election in a particular state might be called into question? You know, it's, it's much too early to tell. I mean, I think part of the question for us is, as we're looking at where are we likely to see uh, election disputes. As I told my students yesterday, as we were talking about some of these questions, um, you know, it is often in pl places in an area that you're not going to predict. Um, in many respects, the parties have identified some of the most the places that are vulnerable, and they're already starting, they've already litigated some of those questions. So it's the things that, that are unanticipated and the areas that are unanticipated and trying to get a sense of where that might be, uh, that's often what catches us by surprise because those are the things that we didn't, we weren't on the lookout for. So what I'm trying to look for are details and clues for where those might be, and that's what we're going to keep our eye on during this election day. Also, just for viewers who are concerned about something like this happening, or or, or they've heard a lot of chatter about that brings calls into question the safety and security of our elections. Just what's your sense of how our elections are conducted in the U.S.? Should people feel confident? Oh, absolutely. I think people should feel confident. I mean, when you think about what we've been able to achieve uh, this election and past elections, um, we've really had um, a relatively good run for how decentralized elections are in the U.S. So I do think that people should feel confident. Obviously, if they have issues, uh, they can contact the state and local election officials in their area. Uh, the political parties and their allies are waiting by for any issues related to voting in order to litigate or try to address those questions. But for the most part, I think Americans should feel fairly confident in, in our elections. And part of the good news so far is that a lot of people have already voted in this election. And yes, we have seen some issues and we obviously have seen some litigation. But for the most part, uh, this election has run relatively smoothly. We'll know by the end of the day, you know, we'll see 
we'll know by the end of the day, but Americans should definitely have confidence in, in, our, in our elections. And if we don't know by the end of the day, it doesn't mean something's wrong. It just means things could be close no, 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 or it no, could no, be right. exactly how elections are supposed to be run. No, what, what I mean is we will know by the end of the day, right, we'll know by the end of the day if there are issues, right? We may mm. not know who wins, or, right, but we will have a sense of what the issues are by the end of the day. But so far, uh, I have to say that with early voting, um, that things have proceeded relatively smoothly. Mm -hmm. Professor Charles, we appreciate it. Thanks for making us feel a little bit better about everything this morning. Thanks. Let's bring in Investopedia's editor-in-chief, of course, is our friend Caleb Silver. He's going to give us a look at the financial implications of this election. And first, markets have just opened. Anything we should be keeping our eye on as it relaxes to Election Day? Yeah, markets are slightly higher today, but they've been choppy for the past few weeks, and that's yeah. what you get going into an election. Election years are pretty strong for the stock market. In this election year, the stock market is up almost 20 percent. Best election year performance since 1936. Does that have anything to do with the election? Absolutely not. It has a lot to do with corporate profits. But there is a lot in the balance here as it relates to the economy. We know markets like certainty. <laughs> One thing that is extremely uncertain this morning is who will win this election. The polls have just this total dead heat. It's kind of stayed that way. Not a lot of indications of which way the wind is going to blow. Number one, has that been impacting the markets? And number two, if we still don't know, let's say tomorrow, if this race is too close to call, which is a total possibility, does that impact the markets? Yeah, uncertainty is like kryptonite for investors because we mm. can't see the future and we don't know what to do. And if this lasts for a long time, if we don't know, that could definitely add to more volatility. But in general, what investors need to focus on is not the top of the ticket, even though that gets all the attention. It's the makeup of Congress, because that could dictate whether or not we get the extension of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs. Act. That's a very big deal, especially for corporations and their corporate tax rate, especially for individuals paying income taxes. But things like tariffs is something that if Trump were to be elected, he could enforce himself. But it's Congress and the makeup of Congress that really dictates the way policy will go. And that has the biggest impact on us as spenders, as consumers in the U.S. economy. And we know how important the economy is to voters in this election. Consistently a top issue. Caleb, thank you so much. We'll yeah. see you in a little bit. Well, our special Election Day coverage continues after the break. Don't go anywhere. We have more live coverage all throughout the morning as voters head to the polls. Welcome back. With the race so close, who wins the election could come down to which demographic groups turn out to cast their ballots and also who stays home. We have NBC News senior national politics reporter John Allen. He's been with us all morning. And now we're going to just talk to him to break down these groups and what he's watching here. First, we've got, of course, that big horse race number. I mean, it's just neck and neck. It has been. It stayed that way. You've reminded us of this. One area, though, where we do see some significant gaps, changes in numbers here, is this gender gap. I mean, it really does almost seem unprecedented just how big that chasm, somebody called it this morning, which I think is a good word, with women breaking for Harris. And we are seeing more men, and we're seeing it in young men, too, breaking for Trump. Walk us through just how important that could be. Uh, it, it could make the determination in the election. Women... Uh, vote more than men do traditionally, historically, and I expect in this election that'll be true. Uh, you see a 16-point uh, advantage for Harris with women, an 18-point advantage uh, for Trump with men. Um, it's not clear exactly because women vote more. Uh, what you know, those let's put it this way: those gaps are very close, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't, we don't know what's going to happen today. Tens of millions of voters haven't even cast their ballots yet, um, but uh, I think what we've seen from the ca candidates is really leaning into this. Uh, yes. Particularly on the Trump side, he has had this sort of, uh, you know, the bro party bus uh, at the end of his campaign here. Uh, he's brought in, uh, you know, men who uh, talk to young men on social media or on podcasts. Joe Rogan endorsed him yesterday. Um, there's been this very sort of uh, masculine vibe and uh, some would say, uh, you know, fake masculine vibe to the Trump campaign over the course of the last couple of uh, weeks. And as a result, I think you're seeing some of that. Uh, gender gap on that side. On the other side, of course, women have been fired up uh, about politics and about Donald Trump for a long time. Uh, not all women are uh, opposed to him, of course, but the majority of women have been. And, uh, you know, the Dobbs decision overturning of Roe versus Wade, we saw that in the midterms in 2022. That was a big part of it. And I think there are a lot of women who are just kind of sick of the way Donald Trump talks and the way he deals with uh, with issues. I think they find him, you know, to be what Kamala Harris is arguing, which is unhinged and unstable. And mm. so, you know, it's long been true that uh, that Republicans looked at women voters, particularly suburban women voters, educated, relatively wealthy suburban uh, women voters, uh, white women voters, as uh, targets for um, the security argument. 
you know, to basically say uh, the Republicans will take care of uh, the country and they will provide security. And um, now you see Kamala Harris sort of making that argument and saying Trump is what makes you unsafe. Mm. Well, it's been interesting, too, to watch Trump kind of not even try to eat away at those women margins, but just double down when it comes to men. I mean, he said when he says he's going to protect women, he says, and I'm quoting here, whether they like it or not, mm -hmm. um, which, uh, you know, I don't have to be explicit about how most women hear that. Right. Um, <laughs> it was in the context mostly of the border and immigration and what he would do in that way, but but absolutely. And it's something we, of course, also saw uh, the Harris campaign seize on immediately have in ads. I also want to ask you about the black and Latino vote. Uh, two other important demographics here, how they break could make a huge difference for either campaign. What are we seeing and what are you thinking? Yeah, the good news for Donald Trump and the bad news for Kamala Harris is that Donald Trump has done a, a lot of work to appeal to uh, young black men and young uh, Latino men in particular. Uh, the bad news for Donald Trump and the good news for Kamala Harris is that those are the least likely, <laughs> among the least likely cohorts to vote. Um, and even if they show up in larger numbers, particularly if you're talking about African-American men, Donald Trump cutting into that group uh, is not enough to offset um, the value that Kamala Harris gets with more young African-Americans showing up. She's still going to win that group. Um, so, you know, for every extra set that gets kind of tossed out there, that, you know, and is going to vote that wouldn't have voted otherwise, um, it actually benefits her. The question is, with Trump cutting in, if you've got voters who are going to vote anyway, um, him getting better margins mm. is, is helpful mm -hmm. to him. Mm. John Allen, who will be with us all morning. By the way, thanks for dressing up for us. I mean, right? With the well, tie nice and everything? Well, you look? Your in-studio look. Oh, uh, you know, I had to look nice for you. <laughs> He's been with us all morning. He'll continue to be with us. We've got a lot more to get to. Our special live Election Day coverage continues coming up next. Welcome back. We talk a lot about the historic nature of this election. Maybe you're sick of hearing us say it's a historic election, but it is. From former President Trump being the oldest candidate in history to Vice President Harris being the first woman and first woman of color to lead a major party ticket. But there are more reasons that make this election historically significant. For more on how this election will be remembered in U.S. history, let's bring in NBC News contributor Jonathan Alter. Jonathan, great to have you on set on a big day. So great to be here. Good morning. Thank you so much. So there's the obvious, the things I just said. It could be our first female president. It could be our oldest president. But there are a lot of other little things that are kind of unusual that, that really do go down in history books, so to speak. Remind us of some of the other historical nature here. So I don't think these other things are that little. Yeah, uh, this yeah. is really the first time that we've seen a campaign uh, between a small-D Democratic president happens to be the Democratic nominee. But by small d, I mean somebody who believes in our system of democracy, who believes in the ideals of our founders, the rule of law, the peaceful transfer of power. These are things that have been taken for granted in presidential elections for more than 200 years mm. since George Washington first established these. That's on the one side. On the other side, we have a candidate who, by his own description, is an authoritarian. And we don't, we have not before lived in authoritarian society. And he believes that if the president does it, it must be legal. And his model is somebody like Viktor Orban, the president of Hungary, who we just spoke, Donald Trump just spoke to a few days ago. This is a very different system than we've had in the United States. So this contest is not just about all the issues. Issues come and go. I'm not minimizing their importance. But this is about fundamental ideas on how we organize our society. Uh, is it authoritarian or is it a republic? And how do uh, you think that means we look at this election's potential impact on our future? Because every election, you know, we talk about how historic, uh, yeah. it's consequential, it's pivotal, yeah, yeah. it could be the future of the nation, but it sounds like you actually mean that right now. Yes. So this is the 12th presidential campaign I've covered. <laughs> Hope I don't look that old. Uh, and by far the most significant, and I think you could make a very good argument that it's the most significant choice since the election of 1864, when Abraham Lincoln was running for re-election, and his opponent, General George McClellan, was ready to make a separate peace with the South, which, by the way, a few weeks ago, Donald Trump wondered why didn't they just settle 
with the South. So McClellan was going to, you know, allow the Confederacy to exist. He was against abolition. There was a lot on the line in that 1864 election. Maybe not quite as much in this election, but getting close to that in terms of its importance. When you have one candidate, Donald Trump, who says in a very upfront way, I'm for suspending the Constitution. I'm for using the presidency to achieve, quote, retribution against my political uh, enemies, who has talked about using the National Guard, even the military, against his political rivals, and people like Paul Pelosi, who just happen to be related to his political rivals, who's talking about camps uh, for, for migrants, which are reminiscent of the Japanese internment camps that you know developed uh, during World War II, a wartime exigency. So this is a very different situation. This is not, you know, taxes go up, taxes go down. Right. Maybe stipulate, I don't like Kamala Harris's immigration, Joe Biden's immigration policy, which Kamala Harris supported too much, you know. I've got this view or that view on these other issues. This is about first principles. Do we believe in the rule of law? Do we think it's okay to have a convicted felon as president of the United States? These are very different questions that have been... Than yeah, I think it's important, been, though, right? I mean, yeah. we are just about out of time, though, but to remember that... Uh, Basically, according to polls, exactly as many people support Harris as support Trump. So we've oh, got yeah, half yeah, the yeah. country, maybe That's half of our viewers course. who are listening to us right of now, who, who that is who they're casting of, their of vote Of course, for. of course. And by the way, I think anybody who s says anything critical about Trump supporters, I've got a big problem with that. Like, mm -hmm. it, nobody should ever disrespect voters. But they do need to understand what the stakes are mm. in this election. And it's not a normal situation after January 6th. And I, I hope that people look, they recall what happened on January 6th before they cast their ballots. Important context there. Jonathan yeah. Alter, big morning. Thank you yeah, for your thank time. Thank you so much. Well, whoever wins this election will face a whole host of global crises. We just mentioned some of them. And from the devastating war in the Middle East to tensions with Russia and China, the next leader will be dealing with an unprecedented set of challenges on the world stage. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons joins us from Dubai on this. Hey, Keir, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. We're talking about the stakes of this election there. This is Dubai Humanitarian in the UAE. It is the biggest aid facility in the world, and it's symbolic of one of the escalating global challenges that the next president, whoever it is, uh, will face. This warehouse is run by the UN. You can see uh, USAID is here. I'm told back in 2017, this whole facility housed around $43 million of aid. Since then, of course, the Trump administration, the Biden administration, here last month, they'd risen to $200 million of aid. This morning, America is voting amid multiple international conflicts and crises, with the potential to send shockwaves around the globe. Former President Trump has vowed to end conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East. I will restore peace in the world. While Vice President Harris just this week said, I will do everything in my power to end the war in Gaza. The scale of the world's challenges is visible at this massive humanitarian aid warehouse outside Dubai. They're packing trucks for Lebanon. They've sent help as far as Ukraine. We have nearly 300 million people uh, in need of humanitarian assistance. 300 million. This is driven by conflicts, by climate change crises, by economic hardships. The U.S. is the world's largest donor of international aid. But how much America should intervene globally is on the ballot in this election. NBC News spoke to people in Tel Aviv. So it depends on American help for us. And Gaza. Help to stop the, the war. Another pressing issue that will be in the new president's international inbox. North Korea, test firing multiple ballistic missiles overnight. Kim Jong-un, who Trump last met in 2019, is now pictured alongside nuclear centrifuges and is sending troops to help President Putin. But American adversaries like Russia, Iran and China don't necessarily see eye to eye on what president they would want, according to an assessment by U.S. open source analysts Filter Labs, which uses AI and experts to filter social media and government channels, shared exclusively with NBC News. What we've seen 
are three very different responses from China, Russia, and Iran. On the whole, Russia is very supportive of Trump. On the streets of Moscow last month, not everyone agreed. Trump said that he can solve the problem, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine uh, in 24 hours. It is ridiculous. China may be the next president's greatest challenge, with Trump promising a minimum 60% tariff on Chinese imports and the ever-present threat of a Taiwan crisis. I don't think it is the position for China to say which one is better. Filter Lab's analysis finding many Chinese people do not expect a change in relations no matter who wins. And Savannah, back at this massive warehouse, I'm told the amount of aid they've had to send to conflict zones in just the last year has doubled. And take a look at that, Savannah. The shelves are emptying as fast as they can fill them, Savannah. All right, Keir Simmons, thank you so much. We've got a lot more to get to this morning. Our special election day coverage continues live up next. All right, it's looking like a great day to head to the polls in most of the country. Here with us is NBC meteorologist Angie Lassman to give us our election day forecast. Hey, Angie. Hey there, Savannah. All important election day forecast. And we do have some good news. It's not just bad news. Of course, we've got some rain to contend with. But parts of the eastern half of the country dealing with nice conditions. It's going to be a little warm. We've got Boston to Washington, D.C., even Cleveland, Nashville, all dealing with dry conditions today. Out west, a little bit of snow across the Rockies. What's really going to get your attention and potentially impact you this morning, especially is the rain stretch from the Gulf Coast up into the Great Lakes. So let's talk about some of that rain you might see in places like Traverse City, Saginaw, Grand Rapids. You'll need the umbrella from Green Bay to Milwaukee as well. Those showers and thunderstorms will be possible, so the roads will be wet. At 75 degrees in Detroit, though, it'll be a little windy, but the temperatures are going to be mild. And that goes for most of Pennsylvania as well. Into the 80s for Pittsburgh, we'll see mostly sunny conditions, no rain to deal with for folks there. Across parts of the southeast, a little bit of rain for Asheville and Augusta, but otherwise nice conditions. Conditions, sun and clouds mixing in, and those mild conditions will last through the day. You won't have to worry about those extra layers. That goes for parts of uh, the southwest, too. Arizona specifically, sunny skies. I don't think you can get a better forecast than mid-70s in Phoenix with full sunshine today. We've got Las Vegas into the low 70s. Savannah we will see mild and dry conditions, but a little windy conditions across parts of Nevada. Overall, a pretty good forecast for Election Day. All right, Angie Lassman, that's good news, especially in our battlegrounds for people getting out there. Thank, Thank you. you. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Do not go anywhere right now. We continue live. Good morning. It is 10 o'clock here on the East Coast, 7 a.m. out west, but everywhere it is Election Day in America. Two candidates. Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump both vying for the nation's vote today after a campaign that's seen more than its fair share of twists and turns. A sitting commander-in-chief, President Joe Biden, bowing out from his re-election push. Deadly violence on the trail, putting the Secret Service squarely in Capitol Hill spotlight. And a final battleground blitz, all to convince a country that they are right for the White House in 2024. I will strengthen our military, I will restore peace in the world, and I will rescue the American dream. We're going to have the American dream back soon. We are optimistic and we are excited about what we can do together. And we know it is time for a new generation of leadership in America. And as we hit the top of the hour, polls are now open, both in California and Idaho. Democracy playing out in real time as America anxiously awaits a decision years in the making with its future on the line. We are so happy you are starting out your day with us, a big day, Election Day in America. Good morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe's out on assignment in Battleground, Wisconsin today. We'll talk to him soon. Vice President Harris is looking to make history and become the first woman president in U.S. history. She is set to hold an election night event at her alma mater, Howard University. Of course, also check in with the Trump campaign in just a moment, but we're going to start with NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli. He joins us from Washington with the latest on the Harris campaign. Mike, good morning. What has been the mood so far of the Harris campaign in these final days and this morning? How's she feeling heading into election night? Is she confident even though these polls show a neck and neck race? 
Well, good morning, Sven. I've left my perch at the White House. I'm now just outside the grounds of the Naval Observatory. That's the vice president's residence, and that's where Vice President Harris is starting her day. She's going to be making some phone calls, doing a lot of radio interviews across the battleground states, not taking anything for granted, trying to get some of those folks who may still be thinking of sitting this one out to get out and vote. And there has been a noticeable shift in terms of the uh, mood of the Harris campaign over the last week. A lot of nervousness as she had made her final stops across the battleground states beginning about a week ago. But as she closed out last night in Philadelphia, we heard her. No longer is she necessarily describing herself as the underdog. She's promising, in fact, vowing last night, we will win this. That's not to say they're taking anything for granted, though. I think it was notable they did close in Pennsylvania. 19 electoral votes, the biggest electoral prize on the battleground map. Most of the voting we've seen so far in terms of early voting has been in other battleground states. Pennsylvania has the most same-day voting, and so that's why we're going to see vice presidential candidate Tim Walls hitting Harrisburg today in Pennsylvania. The second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, will be making a last-minute stop uh, in Michigan today. And then we're going to see them all join forces tonight at Howard University, the vice president's alma mater, speaking to the history that she can make as the first black and South Asian woman uh, to be elected president of the United States at one of the nation's uh, most esteemed historically black colleges. Savannah. Mike, let's talk battlegrounds and the strategy from the Harris campaign here. She spent the final day, she exclusively focused on Pennsylvania. That is a crucial state in this election. I'm wondering if they now think it is the most crucial state in her path to 270. Is that the case? And what do they think is their likely path? Well, what the leadership in the Harris campaign has been saying, really from the get-go, even before when it was President Biden at the top of the ticket, that the clearest the surest path to 270 electoral votes is through the blue wall. That includes Pennsylvania as well as Michigan and Wisconsin. You win Pennsylvania, it's really hard to find a pathway to 270 for either uh, candidate, you know, if they don't win Pennsylvania. But when you saw the vice president's stops yesterday, five different stops across Pennsylvania, you got a sense of the different elements that they see as leading to that victory. She stopped, for instance, uh, in Scranton, where there's a heavy middle class union uh, vote. She was making a, a pitch at a canvas kickoff. She then went to Allentown, where there's a significant Puerto Rican population. We saw, we've seen really with the impact that those comments from President, former President Trump's rally at Madison Square Garden have done in terms of lighting a fire under a key voting group. And then those big rallies she did in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, they do think that they have the enthusiasm, the momentum here in the closing stages of the race. They say that a lot of the votes of late deciding voters, according to Harris campaign polling data, has been in their direction. So it's one reason they're really confident, especially in a state like Pennsylvania, where a lot of the vote is going to come in just today on Election Day. All right, Mike Memoli, thank you so much for reporting for us all morning. Now let's get the latest on the Trump campaign and go to NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns. She's in West Palm Beach, Florida. Dasha, good morning. So I want to start kind of similar to where I just was talking there with Mike about, which is where the former president is feeling really confident. As, as Mike just laid out, Pennsylvania is super important for either candidate here. It, it sort of seems like they both really need Pennsylvania on that road to 270. There are other ways mathematically to do it, but that would certainly be helpful and, and a quickest path. Where does the former president feel super confident and explain his last kind of ditch effort yesterday in multiple states? Yeah, well, look, let's see where he was yesterday. He rallied in North Carolina, where he spent a ton of time over the weekend. That's a state where he's kind of playing defense. He won that state in the last two elections, but polling shows this a really tight race there. Then he made his way to Pennsylvania, did two stops there. Pennsylvania is that massive gold prize, as Mike was saying, and then ended his night in Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's a bit of tradition there, but of course, Michigan, another one of those critical blue wall states. Look, the former president himself is projecting confidence. He said last night that he thinks there's a 95 percent chance he will win. That, of course, is overblowing it, considering with the numbers that we have been seeing. But he's doing particularly well in some of those uh, Sunbelt states like Arizona is looking uh, pretty good for for him. Um, of course, we're in Florida. This is now a, once was a swing state, now uh, a, a red state. All, the reality is all of these battlegrounds have just been so tight when it comes to polling. And you've seen that play out in very practical terms with the campaign strategies uh, and looking at where they have been over the last critical few days.
Tasha, something else that we're seeing really shape up here that we imagine is going to be quite consequential is the gender gap. You've been reporting on it. It exists yes. here. I mean, it's a chasm, really. Someone else used that word this morning, and I love it because it's quite apt. Um, we had this kind of surprise Des Moines Register poll out of Iowa that, that illustrates this. It seems a majority of women saying they prefer Harris, while a majority of men prefer Trump. That has been the case, though, no matter the generation, no matter the poll. And we've only really seen that gap widen. What's been interesting to me, and I wonder if you see it the same way, it almost hasn't really felt like the former president has been trying to eat at the margin with women. It was almost like a double down on the support with men. But tell me what you've been seeing, if there have been those appeals to, to women, and how and why you think the support with younger men seems to have grown and become so solid. Yeah, some call it a gap, some call it a chasm. I'd say it's about the size of the Grand Canyon at this point. <laughs> This is going to likely define this election. Look, the former president has been, you're right, Savannah, leaning into platforms and talking points that really cater to men. And in the middle of a speech in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania last night, he got the endorsement of the nation's most popular podcaster, Joe Rogan. Now, that could help him with men, as Rogan has a heavily male audience, a very large male audience. Not likely to help him with women, though. He did bring out conservative commentator Megyn Kelly onto the stage last night. She'd been critical of, of Trump's and, and the campaign's approach with women, but came out to help him make the case yesterday. But for the most part, you're right. He's been leaning into uh, podcasts that cater to men, TikTok accounts uh, that cater to young men in particular, uh, men of color. That's where they think they can uh, bolster that support. But when it comes to women, he's had a really hard time making a closing argument that appeals. He has called himself the father of fertilization uh, and he has said some things that have turned women off like saying the other week that he would be the protector of women quote whether they like it or not that's the kind of tone that the women we've talked to across battlegrounds say is is putting them off a little bit savannah all right dasha burns reporting from the trump campaign as she has for us for quite some time all over the country we appreciate it we'll talk to you in a bit let's now bring in our friend nbc news senior national politics reporter jonathan allen who's been with us all morning Okay, John, I'm hoping that what we could do right now is kind of help people understand when they can look for what and where, which Ooh. is a little complicated, and I know that. But I say that because we know, for example, earlier I asked you what, what's the state that you're really keeping eyes on, and you said Pennsylvania. We also know that Pennsylvania is one where there's a lot of reasons why we might not know it for a while, because of when they're allowed to start counting those mail-in ballots, because of how spread out the state is, things like that. So let's put Pennsylvania aside for a second, because if that's not going to be something that people can say, oh, look at Pennsylvania tonight. Are there things that you're looking for tonight that are interesting to you? North Carolina, could we know that earlier? If it goes blue, that's a big deal. Things like that. Yeah, I mean, look, I think, uh, you know, we're going to see the polls close uh, in Virginia pretty early. We're going to mm -hmm. see the polls close in Florida pretty early. And even though those aren't states that where you expect there to be, um, you know, expect there to be a competition at the presidential level, uh, we're going to be able to look at uh, some of the parts of those states that react uh, to elections the way that other states that are in battlegrounds do. So, you know, in Virginia, you're going to look um, in the suburbs of Richmond to see, uh, you know, how suburban voters are doing. You might look at uh, turnout for Harris uh, in the southeastern part of the state in Virginia. Uh, might look um, in parts of uh, Florida to see um, what Puerto Rican voters are doing, uh, you know, in Orlando. Uh, to get a sense of what might happen mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania. So you start to get a sense early in the night of at least what some of those projections, you know, might start to, to look like. But the thing is, it's so close. And unless unless that changes, if it continues to be so close in these uh, swing states as millions of people cast their votes today, uh, it may not be that those things that might otherwise be predictive are actually predictive. So we'll also possibly know that it's going to be very close. Right, absolutely, <laughs> which doesn't help us know much for the end result. Right, I mean, we would all want to say, like, look, it'd be great if we could, you know, at 11 o'clock tonight or whatever, everybody knows what how every state voted. Uh, the truth is that won't happen. Um, but I, I think there's a reasonably good chance that we'll have a sense of where things are headed, mm -hmm. um, you know, at least by the early morning hours. All right, John Allen's going to stay with us uh, throughout the show as he has all morning. Let's kick off this hour's though, tour of battleground states. We've got a team of correspondents standing by across the country this morning. 
Julie Serkin is in Pennsylvania. Yasmin Basugian is in Michigan. Maura Barrett is in Wisconsin. And Kathy Park is in Ohio. Look at this all-female screen. Love to see it. Good morning to all of you, Julie. I will start with you. So, I mean, Pennsylvania, we know it's one of the tightest races in the country right now. John Allen told me it is the state that he is keeping his eyes on the most closely in the last couple hours. You're in Allegheny County, which has been safely blue in recent election cycles. But do we think it's likely to stay that way this time around? And does that mean anything, a larger message about what we could see in Pennsylvania? That's a great question, Savannah. And typically what John Allen says, I follow because <laughs> Pennsylvania is a state that either candidate would have to win most likely if they want to win the election just due to it, the amount of electoral votes here, 19, the most out of any battleground state. You asked a really good question. Is Allegheny County likely to stay blue? Yes, it is. But the question for Harris is, can she outperform, outpace how Biden did here in 2020? He outpaced Hillary Clinton by about 40,000 votes in Allegheny County. Why does that matter? Because it is is really like a blue island surrounded by red counties, counties that have trended more red even in recent election cycles. You saw both Trump and Harris close out their campaigns, the second to last appearances here in Pittsburgh. I was at the Trump rally. Harris was just a couple of blocks away. Both had big crowds here. And I talked to a couple of voters. There have been a steady stream. I'm in the swingy suburbs of Pittsburgh, about northwest from the city itself. Some people are voting for Trump. Some are voting for Harris. This particular place has one one district on the bottom floor, another on the top floor. The top floor went for Trump by 23 votes in 2020. The bottom for Biden by 12 votes. So you really can't get any swingier than this. And we'll see what happens when polls close tonight, because, of course, they can't start counting until 8 p.m. Julie, such important information out of Pennsylvania there. We'll keep our eyes on it and talk to you in a bit. Let's go over to Michigan next. We've got Yasmin Vasugi in there, as I mentioned. She's in Dearborn. And Yasmin, this is interesting and a really important issue in this election, and one I'm not sure we're talking about enough. Yeah. So, so in, in this particular city, it became the first Arab-majority city. We know many Arab-American voters traditionally vote Democrat, but they've signaled they won't this time because of the war in Gaza and the Biden administration's military support of Israel and their relationship, of course, of, of Harris to Biden as his vice president. I've been talking also with voters in Michigan who are part of what they call the uncommitted vote, where they are only committed to that mm. war ending and not committing to any candidate. Where could their votes go instead, and how does that ultimately impact the overall race for Michigan? Well, it's interesting because actually the leader of the uncommitted vote actually endorsed Kamala Harris um, and Tim Walls in the last couple of days in the lead up to mm -hmm. um, Election Day and also um, trying to get their followers of the uncommitted vote behind Kamala Harris and Tim Walls. But overall, I've been speaking to a lot of folks, especially Arab Americans here in Dearborn, that are voting third party for Jill Stein for the Green Party because they kind of want to break the system. They want a third party candidate or the viability of the choice of a third party candidate because, as you mentioned, right, the Biden administration's choices that they've made when it comes to um, the war in Gaza, though Harris and Walls are hoping to make that up with the female vote, the female suburban vote, especially when it comes to reproductive rights. I mean, I'm here in this kind of classic uh, middle school, Savannah, right? Set goals, work hard, make healthy choices, your PE life skills. They should write on this thing, vote as well, right? Because you got <laughs> voters here in Dearborn in this middle school making their way um, down the hallway, coming in through election entrance, asking Sam to swing around here as I walk in, right? Getting their paper getting their precincts here, getting their ballots, and then filling out their ballots and casting that ever-important vote in this integral, incredibly important, I'll use Julie Serkin's words here, let's walk back out, Sam, so that we're not disturbing the vote, swingy state of Michigan. And again, we're looking at 200,000 or so Arab American voters, registered active Arab American voters, we're looking at turnout. 45% um, of early votes already in, that's 3.2 million active registered voters. When are we going to get the decision? When are we going to get results out of Michigan? Possibly, as I'm hearing from Secretary of State, um, sometime midday tomorrow, Savannah. All right, Yasmin, thank you so much for our look there. Let's cross over to Wisconsin. Mora is in Madison's Dane County. Mora, this is a county, it's known for being one of the most reliable voting counties in the country. It's also blue, and that's not necessarily expected to change, but is it expected to keep up a tradition of, of turnout in this election? And also, in a battleground state, it's about the margin game, right? Could, could it be less blue, let's say, and that overall contributes to a Republican win? What are you sensing? What are you seeing there? 
Well, Savannah, this when you talk about a reliable county for context, back in 2020, 89 percent of registered voters turned out in Dane County. Now, that is way more than the national average. And so that's what the campaigns are looking to see here today, uh, specifically for the Kamala Harris campaign, because back in 2020, three quarters of uh, that vote went for Joe Biden. Now, the key thing that you're talking about there with the margins uh, back in 2016, former President Trump won Wisconsin by about 20,000 votes. Fast forward to 2020. Joe Biden won also by about 20,000 votes. And so this really does swing back and forth as we're going with the theme of these battleground states. And so what they're hoping to see here, the Harris campaign, is increasing those margins here in a reliably blue area so that if there's any drop off in those suburban counties, those rural counties, that will help them with the margins. Now, as you can see behind me, it's kind of a slow and steady uh, stream of voters, but we've got uh, the, the election officials and volunteers working to check everybody in here today. It's a rainy day in Madison, which is not nice ideal situation, election officials tell us, because people don't want to wait in line when it's raining. But the thing that I will note, uh, more than a million people in Wisconsin have already cast their early ballot, about 325,000 of them here in Dane County. And so that'll give you a sense of what the early vote will look like as we're looking to catch up on uh, the election day vote here, Savannah. All right, Maura, thank you so much. And finally, let's move across to Ohio. Kathy Park is there for us. Kathy, that isn't considered really one of the big seven battleground states, but we know it's one of the most important ones to watch because we get reported results early typically and then we get that initial indicator of where the night be going night might be going tell us about what we should be watching out for there what you're hearing from voters Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. That's right. Well, the polls open at 6.30 this morning. They'll close at 7.30 tonight. And we are told by the Office of the Secretary of State that we could see returns as early as 8 o'clock tonight. But as you mentioned, the Buckeye State has been turning red in recent years. Uh, voted for Trump in 2016, also in 2020. And I want to mention the latest New York Times polling. It actually shows Trump leading at 53 percent, Harris 45 percent. And we should note that we are standing at this polling station here in Hamilton County in Cincinnati because we're literally in the backyard of our vice presidential uh, candidate J.D. Vance. We saw him earlier this morning cashing his ballot alongside his wife. He seems to be in pretty good spirits going into today. Um, but Savannah, we should also point out that we are here in Ohio because we're watching a very uh, closely watched uh, nationalized Senate race between the longtime incumbent Sherrod Brown as well uh, as a challenger, the GOP newcomer Bernie Moreno. And political analysts are saying, look, for Brown survival, it really depends on those split ticket voters and the big Democratic turnout in cities like Cincinnati, Columbus, as well as Cleveland. And we should also note that this has now become the most expensive Senate race in U.S. history with both of these campaigns spending roughly $500 million. Savannah? Wow. Kathy, Mora, Yasmin, Julie, thank you all very much for that battleground whip. We're going to continue a look at some of the states, and we're going to dig in on Florida now. NBC News correspondent Marissa Parra, she joins us from South Florida. Uh, Marissa, good morning. So we know the polls there have been open for about three hours now. First, what are you seeing where you are? What is the mood like? Hey, so I can tell you right now, it has been a downpour. In fact, um, it's raining. It's been raining pretty hard where we are right now in Miami-Dade County, guys. And so we're outside of a polling station here in Doral. I'm going to have my photographer zoom in and show you what we are seeing, which are voters gathering, sheltering from the rain, but still doing their civic duty and voting here. So I can tell you, I've spoken to a number of voters over the last week with early voting. Um, a lot of people trying to get that out of the way. We know over 8 million votes already cast across the state, both in person and over mail, guys. And so a lot of people um, already taking note of the fact that Republicans do seem to be ahead when it comes to those early voting numbers, at least registered Republicans. But of course, uh, the show is really just beginning here, guys. Marissa, that that downpour is certainly a bummer because that can always, of course, yeah. impact turnout. <laughs> and I'm sorry that you have to be standing out in it, but we appreciate it. Um, yeah. I do want to ask you also, and it's interesting to hear you note the fact that Republicans kind of seem to have turned out more in early vote. But one of the big things in Florida, of course, is this is one of those states, one of several, that has abortion on the ballot. Now, we know that to be such a yes. motivating issue for voters. I'm wondering what you think that means. Does that mean that there is a surprise Democratic swing if Democratic voters are the ones who are really motivated to get out and put that on the abortion? Does it mean we see some split ticket voters? What are you looking for when it comes to this issue? And what have you heard from voters who are really energized by that issue? 
Savannah, it is so interesting that you bring this up because it's something I've been keeping a close eye on since I have started covering this, uh, since I've been keeping an eye on this over the last year and since May, of course, when we found out um, this spring that abortion was going to be on the ballot in Florida. And I can tell you right now, anecdotally speaking, uh, a couple things to remember. So one, registered Republicans do seem to be ahead with early voting in Florida, but just because someone is registered with a party does not mean that they're going to be voting according to party lines. I have found registered Democrats who said that they were going to be voting for former President Trump. And I have found registered Republicans who told me they were going to be voting for Ms. Harris. So uh, that is one thing to keep in mind. And another thing, as I was going out into the lines asking people how they were voting, what I found is the majority of people that I found on the ground here, and that is just one very small sample size, Savannah, a lot of people told me that they were voting for former President Trump and they were voting yes on four. So I will say it is entirely possible, something for people to keep in mind, as much as Democrats here, of course, hoping that people voting yes on four will lead to, as well, a, a large Democratic turnout on the right. ballot. Um, it is possible that we could see former President Trump, uh, the, the favored person here in the state of Florida, as well as abortion rights passed. But it does require 60 percent or more, which is a higher threshold than surrounding states. Absolutely. It's so interesting to see what happens with that one and maybe an indication of what happens across the country. Marissa Parra in Florida for us. Thank you so much. I'm going to bring in John Allen again. He's been with us all morning. And I do just want to ask you a quick question to follow up there on what she just said when it comes to that kind of idea of, of split ticket or what it means. Because Florida is one of those places that expected to announce at least preliminary results pretty early, something we can maybe get a pulse on. Are you interested to see if the fact that abortion is a motivator gets someone to the polls and then, as Marissa just said, it actually changes the top of the ticket for them as well? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think if we are, are able to sense that that's going on in Florida, um, you know, you may be able to extrapolate that that's going on in other parts of the country. Uh, on the, you know, conversely, if it doesn't seem that there is, um, you know, sort of uh, some huge surge right. in voters, uh, the fact that it's on the ballot means that for some of those voters, they will separate that question from yep. their presidential question, right? Yep. But others, it may simply bring out more people uh, who want to vote on that and hmm. connect that vote to their presidential candidate. Um, so I'll be looking for it. I know our friend uh, who we're about to talk to, Steve Kornacki, will be looking for yeah. it. And he's so good that a friend of mine texted me earlier and said, who's going to win tonight? I said, uh, I don't know. And she wrote back, I wish I went to high school with Kornacki. <laughs> <laughs> she can text him instead. That is a nice no tease for what's coming up for us all. <laughs> we are going to have Kornacki in just a moment. Make sure you all tune in at 5 p.m. Eastern. Tom Yamas and Hallie Jackson are going to kick off our special election night coverage and analysis. Then at 6.30 p.m., Lester Holt and Savannah Guthrie take over. As those results start coming in, that's all right here on NBC News Now. But all morning, we've got much more to come here on this special election day edition of Morning News Now. We're going to take a deeper dive into whether America's ready for its first female president if VP Harris were to take the White House. But first, as you just heard, after the break, our own Steve Kornacki, who did not go to high school with John Allen or John Allen's friend, who wishes she had Kornacki's phone number, he's at the big board with more on when exactly we might start to see those results later tonight. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are just a few hours into Election Day, but polls across the country are open for Americans to cast their ballots. Look at this number on your screen. This is the latest NBC News poll. It shows this tied race among likely voters nationwide with 49 percent for Harris and 49 percent for Trump. But the real results will come as ballots are cast, of course, and numbers come in later today. We are so lucky. I'm so excited. We've got NBC News national political correspondent Steve Kornacki with us at the big board to walk us through what he's looking out for. Steve, first of all, I, I just have to say I feel like you'd be into this, too. Of course, in Dixville Notch, New Hampshire, three and three a tie, the first place that votes on Election Day in person. I mean, were you just like, duh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, you could even, we got the scoreboard up and running. Yes, one little <laughs> tiny, not even town in uh, northern New Hampshire, three to three. So there's your national count. <laughs> Tell us what you're keeping your eye on as we get started today. Yes, uh, so let's take a look here tonight when the <laughs> polls start closing. <laughs> We're about seven and a half hours away from the first poll close, but that's going to be uh, a lot of Indiana, Kentucky, not expected to be competitive. Probably not going to learn much in that six o'clock hour, but seven o'clock Eastern, that is when the action begins. And the numbers are going to come fast and furious out of Georgia, we believe. Why? Because Georgia has revamped the way they do these elections, mm -hmm. at least the reporting of these elections. And it means essentially that about 80% of all the votes that have been that are cast in Georgia, we're going to have the results of in the first hour between 7 and 8 p.m. 
All that will be left after that is the people in Georgia who are going out to the polls today and voting today. But the vast majority of the vote in Georgia has already taken place through early voting, and all of that will be reported out in the first hour, at least under this new state law. So we could get a lot of clarity there early. North and Carolina. And Steve, let me yeah. ask you, while, while you're still in Georgia, a quick question, because we know that's a swing state, kind of coin toss kind of thing. Does that mean at 80 percent we know or, or because of who voted early or that still, even though we've got 80 percent of the vote and we don't know for a long time? Yeah, I don't know if it'd be a long time. It depends. I mean, this could be razor thin and it still could yeah. be days if it ends up being like a recount. But again, keep in mind that what you're getting in that 80 percent is the early vote. That's right. folks who voted by mail, folks who voted in person early. What's left is the election day vote. And what we typically see with the election day vote is it's more Republican friendly. Mm -hmm. So we may be in a situation where in that 80 percent, the Democrats are doing better than they end up doing. And the question will become, yep. if the Democrats are ahead, does Trump overtake them with the same day? Oh, sounds like some drama that we're going to see you at the board for. OK, keep taking us through these poll closes. Yeah, no, I mean, look, 730 North Carolina. It's uh, going to be, I think, somewhat similar to Georgia, just in terms of the speed here. Again, the possibility there in the first couple hours to get a lot, most of the vote in uh, reported out in North Carolina. Eight o'clock is when we start getting those big northern tier battlegrounds. There's an asterisk on Michigan because there's a couple of small counties that are in the central time zone. But basically, the whole state closes at 8 p.m. We'll start seeing those results at 8 p.m. All of Pennsylvania closes at 8 p.m. And one thing to keep in mind there in Pennsylvania, there's a lot of mail-in voting in Pennsylvania, not as much as four years ago. But the way just about all the counties are going to do it in Pennsylvania is Probably not long after 8 p.m., they're going to report out the results of the vote by mail in Pennsylvania. And again, that's a very Democratic-friendly group of votes, the mail-in votes in PA. So again, you can expect the Democrats, Harris, to put up her best numbers in Pennsylvania with what you see in that, say, 8 to 9 o'clock hour. And again, like Georgia, but pro probably even more dramatically, the story will be, OK, once you get through the mail, Trump's going to be behind. Can he catch up with the same-day vote? It mm -hmm. then gets reported out. So that's, you know, PA, keep that in mind. Arizona says nine, but the state law is Eastern. The state law is they got to wait an hour after that to report any numbers. So really in Arizona, 10 p.m. Eastern is when we'll get some numbers there. Wisconsin, a biggie, obviously, 9 p.m. Nevada is 10 o'clock. But again, keep in mind, that's when they close 10 o'clock Eastern. But we've seen elections in the past where it's still a couple hours after that before you even get any results out of Nevada. So again, we may get clarity a little bit, maybe mm. a lot from the east. If we're waiting on the west, that could be a while. Steve, I know I've got to keep you on time because a lot of people want to talk to you today, but we do have to just look at the map while we've got you. Remind us electoral path paths here. Um, what's maybe the most likely, what's the easiest for each candidate? Yeah, it's blank now, but I'll set it up like this because this is how both parties see the map mm -hmm. with these seven core battleground states. And you know, keep in mind what we just said there. The action is going to begin in the southeast right. in Georgia and North Carolina. Now, North Carolina was a Trump state in 2020, the only battleground that Trump won in 2020. And uh, Georgia was about a 12,000 vote difference. So yeah. look at it from this perspective. This is an if. I stress this is an if. But if Donald Trump wins the state that he won in 2020, North Carolina, and if he can reverse that narrow, narrow loss in Georgia from four years ago and win Georgia, and again, not impossible if he does this, we would know it in the first few hours. Again, we say Pennsylvania closes at 8 o'clock. If Trump comes into Pennsylvania with these two in his pocket, then the stakes are enormous because if Trump wins Pennsylvania on top of those two, he hits 270 on the dot. And you saw Kamala Harris finish her campaign in Philadelphia last night for good reason for their campaign. They want to block this. If they end up in that situation, they absolutely must win Pennsylvania. But if this were to happen and Harris were to win Pennsylvania, a path opens up for her pretty quickly because if she could then just add Michigan and Wisconsin to Biden states from 2020, take a look at that, she would suddenly hit 270. Mm. So this, there's all sorts of scenarios here. But I think Ooh. that Pennsylvania, when the polls close and we get numbers there, that could pivot us dramatically one way or the other. Steve, I love you. I've been, like, waiting for somebody to just say, you start here and then you go here, and this is what we're looking for. So we're Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania. I love it. Steve, thank you. You have a long night ahead. Uh, we don't know when you're getting any sleep. I don't even need to ask you that. Thank you so much. We'll see you in a bit. We'll see you, you everywhere all Thanks. day, all night. Thank you. When we return, continuing coverage of the 2024 election as voters across America head to the polls. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. Okay, we already know this election has made history, but I mean, it could be a truly historic day because if she were to win, Vice President Kamala Harris will become the first ever female president of the United States. So we are so lucky that we've got NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale. She joins me here on set. She just also happens to be the author of a book. I think we can pull it up. It's called Electable, Why America Hasn't Put a Woman in the White House Yet. There it is. Oh, I love this cover. I there she is. That. There she is. Ali, I mean, like, can we just start on that question? Why do we think it is? By the way, we also have Jonathan Allen on set with us, as he has been all morning, and, and I'll pull him in here. But, Ali, why have we not put a woman in the White House? And if we are to, are, I, I hate to put it as are we ready for it, but, yeah. like, what do you think the country feels about that particular Point. Well, you're a Swifty, so it's right that you would ask the question, <laughs> are we ready for it? But the answer is yes. And actually, the American electorate has told us this time and again, both since Hillary Clinton clinched the nomination back in 2016, mm -hmm. but also in polling throughout 2020 and into 2024. The problem is, in part, the fact that we've never seen it done before. And that lends to something called an imagination barrier, where voters not just have to imagine this particular mm. candidate in the White House, but they also have to imagine something that they've actually never seen before. And so it's baked into the work of any woman who runs, runs for office, but especially now for Vice President Harris, that she has to ask voters to vote for her, to vote for her policies, but also ask them to do a little bit of the extra work of imagining a thing that they haven't seen before, bridging that imagination gap. And have opinions changed drastically on this? Like, do we know that attitudes have shifted? In a way, there was, I'm sure you saw the amazing piece this week from our colleague Andrea Mitchell about putting women in the White House. Yes. There's this great soundbite from Eleanor Roosevelt in there. Well, she's like, well, when we've stopped seeing it as men and women and we're people, but we know there's still all these gender divides in ways, you know, gender pay gap, all different types of things. Have opinions changed a lot? Have we made improvements? we're about to see. Because to me, this is the ultimate test, right? You not only have a moment where a woman is literally on the ballot, but the other central issue, the X factor that all of us talk about is abortion, which I mm. do not assign this issue a gender because I do think that men and women alike are touched by this issue. Mm -hmm. But it is by and large an issue that predominantly will directly impact women. And so the fact that those two issues are on the ballot, it puts gender front and center. And you're watching the gender gap come about in large parts because of the way that gender is baked into Trump as a candidate. I write about this in the book, the idea that although he was running against a woman, gender is so central to the way that Trump presents himself. Mm -hmm. He is macho. He is typically patriarchal. The way that he talks about, I will cherish women, I will protect women, mm. even if they don't want it, he said recently. Right? That's all so baked in. And that's something that's resonant with male voters. And why we're seeing the gender gap be driven so far in that direction for Trump. And then, of course, women coming out for Harris. Typically, you watch women go for the Democratic candidate. If you get even more intricate, though, black women are the centerpiece of the Democratic coalition. White women actually tend to vote Republican. One of the things that I've explored since writing the book is if abortion is something that will motivate white women to vote Democrat instead. Mm. And, and John, you just said to me earlier that you think the gender gap could end up, has the potential to be the defining kind of storyline out of this election. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, we're going to find out tonight, right? Uh, well, maybe, and, and as we look through the data over... <laughs> maybe this week, hopefully. Maybe this tonight week. Tonight is sort of like a... Sometime this year, <laughs> we'll find out. Um, and, but, and we'll look through the data and we'll get an idea of, uh, you know, what's going on. I think, um, and it's it's nice to hear from Ali, who is the person who wrote the book on right, this right. issue. Um, and I, I think she's absolutely right. But I, I watch Kamala Harris... Uh, and I don't think to myself as I watch her that that imagination barrier that you've been talking about is what it was yeah. even four or eight years ago. Mm. Um, mm. I think some people watched Hillary Clinton lose and said this means a woman can't be president. I looked at Hillary Clinton losing, and I think a lot of women who were running for office in 2020, running for president, looked at, at that and said that was a narrow loss, 77,000 votes over three states. She didn't prove a woman couldn't win the presidency. She proved a woman could win the presidency. Didn't that year. Um, and so when mm. you look at Harris now, that imagination barrier that you're talking about, just it keeps keeps getting smaller and thinner and, and less vis visible. But and that was also so central when I was writing the book and asking, OK, well, what will it take? It's more, right? You have so few presidential elections and so few chances for women to run and win. The more that you have in this space, up and down the ballot, House, Senate, gubernatorial, and of course the presidency, the more options and opportunity mm. that you have. The one last thing I will note is Kamala Harris is actively not talking about this. And I think mm. that is just such a moment where you don't, Hillary Clinton did that. She marked the glass ceiling. It remains unbroken. 
Kamala Harris is now taking a very different tack and saying, I think people can see that I show up. I am a woman. I am a woman of color. They're going to vote for me because of what I can do. And my little girl will look at Kamala Harris yeah. and look at, at that and say, that's something I can do. And my son will look at Kamala yeah. Harris and say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's something that women can do. That's yeah. something that I can. So, I mean, I think that there's, you know, just in making that run, just in making the advancements that we've seen um, in vying credibly for the presidency, yeah. you create uh, that vision where there used to be the imagination barrier. Yeah, huge mm -hmm. progress. I think also, hopefully, it's a moment, party aside, yeah. to just note, like, even what's happened so far has been historic. And as a country, you know, we're always excited about any type of firsts or record breakers, no matter if it's, you know, if it's in a sports arena or something yep. like that. So, so why not at least take a moment and recognize that, that this is something, no matter your party, that, that is notable for our country. Ali Vitale, thank you so much. Absolutely. Amazing person to have here on set to discuss this this morning. John Allen, you're probably back with us. You've been here all day. I love it. Thank <laughs> you, you so much. Here now. We, yeah, you, you can't get rid studio, of me. Three AW with us. We really appreciate you being here all morning. Thank you both. Stay with us. Our continuing coverage of Decision Day and America. It continues. Don't go anywhere. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Now we want to take a look at the economic implications of this election. And we're going to talk about how the stock markets are reacting now that they're open. We've got our economic dream team. Look at even on election day, we're going to bobble. You did the bobble, too. We're, I did. did a little bit Finally, of the I did. A uh, little well, in solidarity, right? I make y'all do it every time you're here. We've got Brian Chung and Caleb Silver here to discuss all this. Good morning to both of you. Happy election day, gentlemen. Thanks for being here. Um, so we've been talking ad nauseum, and I keep on, like, cornering you in the hallway to be like, God, election, I mean, economy is the top issue for voters. Um, but, of course, that's on both sides of the aisle. First, just tell us some, some hallmarks of each candidate when it comes to their economic plan. Yeah, and look, when you poll people, they say that the economy is the biggest issue. But unlike things like abortion or even specifically tax policy, it's not a pro or con thing. Mm -hmm. There are many different types of policies that can go into it. So I think the big ones are, first off, taxes and then tariffs. So let's talk about taxes first. Uh, you have Harris that is extending the Biden administration promise not to tax individuals that are making more than $400,000 a year, but she also wants to compensate for that by raising the corporate tax. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the Trump side of things, he wants tax cuts across the board. He wants to extend uh, and even perhaps uh, make more pronounced some of the tax cuts that he had in his first administration. Now, the tariffs front is a really interesting one because, again, we're talking about mm -hmm. inflation right now. If Trump goes through with what he proposes is a 60 percent tariff on Chinese goods and then a 20 percent tariff on everything else, a lot of economists would say that could raise prices even further. But here's the challenge. You know who actually extended some of the tariffs on China from his first administration? It was the Biden administration. Mm. So either way, tariffs are kind of almost a wash, although it depends mm. on the magnitude of them. But tariffs and taxes, I think, are the big policies between the two of them. And it's so interesting because that's something I've heard from voters when I'm out on the trail. Like, I like Trump's tariffs plan. And then on the other side, tariffs plan will increase prices. It's like one of those split things where, where right. you understand why we're in the division that we're in. Caleb, let's talk about the markets. Let's talk about what this could feel like for people today. Obviously, it's been open for a little over an hour now, um, but also how we think it could react as we do get results. Yeah, the stock market's rallying today, but it's been super choppy over the past month, and that's what you get during an election month, October, usually a choppy month, especially going into an election year. But by and large, investors are not too focused on who is winning uh, tonight or when we finally get the results. They're looking at corporate profits, and those could be impacted by uh, the extension of those tax cuts, especially if President Trump wins and he wants to lower the tax rate again for corporations. But they're also looking at the makeup of Congress because tax cuts in general have to be approved by Congress. So they're looking at that. And it's been a really solid year for the stock market, up close to 20 percent, the best election year we've seen since 1936. Investors mm. are betting on the continuation of corporate profits growing. That's what the big bet is, not who wins on the election. Brian, I'm going to ask you about the Fed, but first I'm going to ask Caleb for a magic yeah, trick. They're meeting when? Oh, three uh, days, and, no, four days and uh, five hours and 20 minutes, actually. <laughs> Can Ooh. you do that, Brian? Right on the no, no, I absolutely cannot. <laughs> I forgot my calculator watch today. Normally job. I could just punch it in there. I but. love it so much. Okay, so we are anticipating a cut, but does the election impact that? Tell us what you're looking for from the yeah, Fed. Yeah, it's like not at all the thing that people are worried right. about this week. Like there's a Federal Reserve meeting yeah. also, by the way. But yeah, on Thursday afternoon, they're going to announce their interest rate uh, uh, policy statement. And they had already cut interest rates. They did so in September by half a percentage point, as you'll recall. It's the first interest rate cut in the post-pandemic period. I think the challenge here is that uh, this is happening two days after the election, right? And when you talk about what's happening here, you might think, okay, well, based off the calendar, the Federal Reserve might try to make uh, their decision based off of what's happening in the election. 
Not at all. The Federal Reserve is entirely independent. Yes, the, the people on the Fed are appointed by uh, the president and confirmed by the Senate. It's entirely independent. They're going to see what the economy looks like. They don't want the unemployment rate to spike. That's likely why they'll continue to uh, cut interest rates. Yep. And this will be the first president to enter office in the last four without a recession. The economy is in pretty good shape right now. We just learned that GDP grew at 2.8 percent. Corporate profits are going. The unemployment rate, as Brian said, 4.1 percent. This is a normalizing, pretty steady economy. Good uh, for people out there, no matter who wins this election. But a lot could change, obviously, with the makeup of Congress and how far uh, and how, how long this takes mm. till we get a decision. Caleb, Brian, we appreciate you always. Thanks for letting us bobblehead you even on Election Day. See you all in a little bit. Coming up, it's been an election cycle like no other. So how do we get here? After the break, we're going to take a look at the lead up to one of the closest and most contentious races in history. Stay with us. Finally, this hour, we want to take a look back at an election cycle that's been like none other in history, with so many twists and turns no one could have predicted. Here's NBC News Now anchor Kate Snow with a recap of the major moments from the campaign trail. Do we believe in the promise of America? Our country will be bigger, better, bolder. It's an election fight that looks much different than when it began nearly two years ago to the day. America's comeback starts right now. Former President Donald Trump locked in the Republican nomination with ease, defeating a parade of challengers and battling a slew of legal cases. That is 34 felony counts here, all guilty verdicts. This is unprecedented right. for a former American president to be criminally convicted. This was a rigged, disgraceful trial. His supporters undeterred, believing Trump could best tackle the economy and immigration. I'm the only one in history who got indicted and my numbers went up. Initially set for a rematch against President Joe Biden. I'm still the only person to ever beat Donald Trump. They made history as the oldest major party presidential candidates ever in an American election. A concern for voters and whispers about Biden's mental fitness soon grew louder. The special counsel referred to the president as a, quote, sympathetic, well-meaning and elderly man with a poor memory. My memory is fine. But that first presidential debate in June set off three weeks of unprecedented political upheaval. Look, if we finally beat Medicare. This night got off to a tough start for President Biden. I think it's a legitimate question to say, is this an episode or is this a, a condition? Calls for Biden to suspend his reelection campaign were sidelined by an unthinkable twist. This is an NBC News special report. Take a look at what happened. The 45th president of the United States injured but alive. All of this unfolding with Republicans now gathering to officially nominate Donald Trump at their convention. With his ear bandaged, the former president making an emotional entrance just two days after the attempt on his life. When Donald Trump rose to his feet in that Pennsylvania field, all of America stood with him. I stand before you in this arena only by the grace of Almighty God. That same week, President Biden testing positive for COVID. News broke of different Democratic leaders calling for the president to step aside. My fellow Americans. Days later, the president ending his re-election bid. I revere this office. I love my country more. Endorsing Vice President Kamala Harris and upending the race with just over 100 days until the election. We choose freedom. Democrats quickly energized by their first female nominee of black and Indian descent. <laughs> Harris showing strength on the issues of abortion rights and protecting democracy. Ours is a fight for the future. <laughs> Trump pivoting to his new opponent. I didn't know she was black until a number of years ago when she happened to turn black. A convention coronation in August. Kamala Harris is going to stand up and fight for your freedom to live the life that you want to lead. I accept your nomination to be president of the United States of America. Trump and Harris would meet for the first time in their only debate 
I've never seen a worse period of time. People can't go out and buy cereal or bacon or eggs or anything else. The government and Donald Trump certainly should not be telling a woman what to do with her body. And this famous falsehood. They're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. The vice presidential debate striking a different tone. I agree with a lot of what Senator Vance said about what's happening. And I think that Governor Waltz and I actually probably agree. But the dangers of our nation's divisiveness still on display. The FBI says there has been another possible attempt on former President Trump's life. By fall, the critical battleground blitz amid one of the closest presidential races ever. I'm a gun owner. Tim Walz is a gun. I did not know that. (laughs) If somebody breaks in my house, they're getting shot. I think the bigger problem is the enemy from within. The razor-thin margin bringing out bold-faced names. Vice President Kamala Harris. President Trump must win. Podcast interviews taking center stage. That Trump dance party going viral. And his Madison Square Garden rally sparking controversy. There's literally a floating island of garbage in the middle of the ocean right now. Yeah, I think it's called Puerto Rico. Amid the fallout, the Trump campaign seizing on a Biden gaffe. The only garbage I see floating out there is his supporters. Harris caught on this hot mic moment talking to Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer about male voters. While Trump tries to win over more women. Whether the women like it or not, I've got to protect them. After so many firsts, the last days of a campaign season like no other. And a reminder of what's most important. Get everyone you know, you have to do it. You have to vote, vote, vote. Your vote is your voice, and your voice is your power. All right, thanks to Kate Snow for that recap as we now land on Election Day. Another thing that's unprecedented this election, the early voter turnout. According to NBC's tracker, more than 79 million Americans voted by mail or in person before today. King swing, key swing states, excuse me, like Georgia and North Carolina, are smashing early voting records with more than half of all registered voters there already casting ballots that could have a huge impact and could mean we have more information earlier in the night. That is going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now, but don't go anywhere. Morgan Radford and Vicki Wynn will continue our Election Day coverage after the break. Thank you for being with us on this historic day. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.